Welcome to episode 42 of the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. This is the first in a two episode series that we are doing on the topic of fascia. And we're really excited to talk about this topic today. We know that fascia is a pretty popular topic within the yoga world for sure, but even more broadly, um, you know, in the fitness world, in the therapeutics world, like uh, therapeutic world, like physical therapy, in especially in the body work world, I would say massage therapy, it's definitely plays a big role. So it's a topic of interest in a widespread manner. And Travis and I just wanted to have some good, um, as evidence-based as they can be, conversations around the topic of fascia. And for, for well, l- let me first just say <laughs> that fascia is a, it's a type of tissue in the body, and we are going to define it more thoroughly um, as we move forward in this episode. But just in case you had not heard, like, in case you don't know what fascia is, it's a type of tissue in the body. And there's a lot of interest in it. And um, I would suggest, and I think that many people would agree with me, in suggesting that fascia, just the word fascia, has become a bit of a buzz term or a buzzword these days. Like it's kind of, it's pretty out there. And here's some of the claims that I find that we hear about fascia that I'm pretty sure some of our listeners will resonate with as well. Are we hear about fascia in terms of myofascial release or self myofascial release? So you know, like that's that's kind of body work or massage or in a yoga context, we might like roll on balls or or foam rolling things like that. That's all often falls under the umbrella of this term myofascial release. So fascia is in the term there, myofascial. We also sometimes hear about fascia in terms of fascial chains uh, and fascial meridians, which are these ideas that input that have been put forth about like these linkings together of multiple muscles that form these myofascial like continuum continuums in the body. So that's another place where we hear about fascia. Uh, We hear about the idea of like breaking down fascial adhesions and knots and trigger points in the body. And that kind of gets connected to the fascia fascia topic as well. In the yoga world specifically, we tend to hear that yin yoga, which is one specific type of yoga, we hear that yin yoga specifically targets the fascia. That's a very common claim that we hear in the yin community. What else about fascia? Kind of just this overarching idea that uh, fascia is a tissue in the body that many of us maybe have some problems with or that there's pain, like fascia is causing pain. We even hear claims uh, about that I've seen pretty widespread on social media that fascia is the tissue in which we store our emotions or our trauma. So there's there are those types of claims as well. There's really just a lot. Uh, But what we wanted to focus on in these two episodes, our plan is that for today, part one, we want to give an introduction to fascia, like what is this that we're even talking about? So a good intro, and then turn our attention to the question of whether we can train fascia, like specifically train fascia, like, you know, in like an active movement sense, that's kind of going to be our focus for today. And then our next episode, part two, the plan is in that episode, we will talk about myofascial release and about yin yoga and its connection to fascia. So that's our plan for this two part series. Before we dive in, just some reminders about ways that you can support us and our work with this podcast. You can become a supporter of our podcast for just $3 a month, and the link for that is in the show notes. You can subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating or a review. We'd so appreciate that. You can also stay in the loop on everything that Travis and I have going on around here, all the happenings. You can do that by signing up for my email newsletter at jennyrawlings.com slash newsletter. And lastly, you can consider joining Travis and myself for our one of a kind Strength for Yoga remote group training program which is an awesome strength training program that we designed specifically geared toward yogis. You can read all about it, like at the link in the show notes, and you can use the code podcast 30 for 30% off your first month in remote group training. So again, link in the show notes really to everything that I just said. And now that all of that is said, Travis, my, yeah, 
my question for you is, uh, what types of things have you heard about fascia in general? Well, I was actually reading through my blog archive. I, I Google or not Googled. I searched fascia in my blog archive oh, cool. because I knew that there was one mention of it in a specific article. And then there was a second mention of it, but that one, I, that one wasn't as salient. The first one was a blog post that that one was a guest post. And it was just talking about like how the, um, the lats insert mm -hmm. through the thoracolumbar mm -hmm. fascia, which is like all kosher and good and true. And this other one was uh, a blog post. And that was a guest post. Um, this other one was an, an, a blog post that I had written in 2015 after doing a um, session with a friend of mine who's a body worker. Mm -hmm. And I wrote mm -hmm. about the session that we did together. And cool. he, uh, at the time, was doing Thai style body work. Mm -hmm. And uh, if our listeners are not familiar with that. My experience of it from working with this guy was it's um, it, like it was done kind of on the floor. Like he brought mm -hmm. uh, a cushion or a blanket or some, some surface. And it was very um, it like he was working with his elbows. It like he was mm -hmm. really getting Dating. like hands on. Yeah. Digging in. Um, it was, I think painful if I recall, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, it's fine. I, I was, I was consenting to that. Um, it, and, it, and it, it felt good afterwards. Um, but, but in particular, why I'm talking about this is because what he described that he was doing oh, was right. his, his technique was different from traditional or other massage and that he wasn't targeting the muscles. He was specifically targeting fascia. And so I, you know, I, we talked about this. He was, I, I, he knew a lot more about this than I did. And that was kind of his explanation for it. And then through our conversation, I, I wrote about my experience with, you know, receiving this massage uh, or this body work. Uh, and so that was his explanation was that it it was specific the way that his technique, you know, using his elbows and whatever else uh, was specifically targeting the fascia. Um, I, f I forget if adhesions came into play. I, I think it did actually. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. No, I, I think it did actually, because he noticed in his, like, as he was working with me that my calf uh, was very stuck i think mm -hmm. might have been a word that came up um and and actually to my fascination he 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 pointed it out to me like he was like look at how little movement there is between the tissues on your lower leg uh and he said make note of that because after i'm done with you mm -hmm. uh, these tissues are going to glide much more easily and to his credit i perceived and I don't, I don't think I perceived incorrectly that he, they did <laughs> after mm -hmm. he was done an hour with me. Um, I, I seem to have much looser and much more freely moving gastroc memei, memeus. That's your calf um, muscles. Your superficial yeah, calf muscles. That, then, yeah. Then I did before the, the hour of body work. So, uh, but yeah, so he was pointing out these, these sticky tissues and his mm -hmm. style of body work was focused on the fascia uh, to correct or get those tissues unstuck. And so that's mm -hmm. what I wrote about in the that's what you wrote about from eight years ago, 2015, <laughs> um, that th this style of body work targeted the fascia um, and wow. it was different from other body work. And that was my first um, mm. exposure and for for a while like i i so he told me that and i bought it right i didn't mm -hmm. have any i didn't have any reason you not have a to, reason to like question it yeah no and and by all accounts it was a pretty miraculous experience because mm -hmm. i saw firsthand on myself that oh these tissues are moving a lot more freely so that was that was my 
first and firsthand experience with <laughs> fascia uh and then much later came to read more about it and mm-hmm. which we'll, we'll talk about next i'm sure uh but what like what do you remember your first encounter yeah yeah i do uh i I think I told you this a while ago, but I went to massage school mm-hmm. like forever ago. Uh, which I, went I didn't to know about you uh, <laughs> until like a year ago. I which remember, is just, yeah. I don't know how it took that long to come up. Yeah, it just didn't come up for some reason. I think because I so, I don't really, I don't do, I mean, I do maybe massage Craig, my husband, but I don't like market massage is like something that I do. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of just receded into the background for me. I, have, I don't really you know think too much about it but i totally did i did the whole massage i did the whole training i got certified and licensed and this was like in the early 2000s and -hmm. it was when i lived in santa barbara california you were already teaching yoga or i was not teaching yoga yeah this was before okay mm -hmm, before and it was actually my first exposure to learning about anatomy and like the structure of the body it was like the first time that i learned about all the muscles and things like that so it was it was a really good education for me but yeah. um, but of course, the, lumped in with all of that, there was a lot. I mean, I, massage in general and the body work world in general, like there are very evidence based, evidence based like facets of massage. But there's a lot of kind of pseudoscience and misinformation in the massage world as well. And my massage school was like no exception to that. So back then, I did <laughs> not did not know, you know, that what I was being taught was potentially um, not super science based. Uh, mm-hmm. But now that I have the reflection, I can see, you know, where where things maybe weren't so supported. But that was that was the first time I learned about fascia. And I remember our massage teacher uh, taught us um, about I think I really think this is when the fascial like the anatomy trains and the fascial chains were kind of just starting to be more widely you know, talked about. You, and can um, you just describe what that is? in case Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's um, this is this proposition by a body worker named Tom Myers, who is a rolfer, and he proposed that the body has uh, these um, myofascial meridians or myofascial chains. We have twelve of them, according to Tom Myers, and they have different names. And they're basically, like I said earlier, these linking together um, chains or long connections of our muscles. And it's a way that like he's divided up like our 600 muscles or so into these um, these different chains. And I don't remember like all the individual chains and what all the muscles were, but like one pretty well-known one is like the superficial back line, which mm-hmm. I think you've heard of before, Travis. Right? It's mm-hmm. like the plantar fascia on the soles of your feet up through the gastrocnemius, the calves, through the hamstrings, through the sacred tuberous ligament, uh, up through your erector spinae, so the muscles of the back and all the way up. So like the idea would be that all those muscles are are connected like via fascia through fascia and uh that that connection just you know may, means that because they're linked together the tension in one area may create tension down the line and generally they're just like connected. Yeah. So are they sometimes called slings too? Or I, I believe so. Up? No, okay. you're not making yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think some of them are called slings. And like I said, I kind of forget um, like all the different names, maybe like oblique sling, maybe, but there's like spiral yeah. line and there's front lines and there's superficial ones and functional ones, like there are a lot of them. So anyway, back then I remember our, my massage teacher was really excited about, it was kind of like the new thing. And sure. so we learned about that. Uh, I also, that was massage school, but then later, once I was teaching yoga, I also took um, self myofascial release therapy ball training. And that was with Jill Miller. I'm sure that many of our listeners will know who, who Jill Miller is. I, I myself have done a workshop uh, yeah. through Yoga Tune-Up, not with Jill, but with uh, another practitioner using the same methods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, and then one other thing I wanted to say about just my my personal past experience with like the fascia world is that another thing in addition to those things is I also took a training and I want to say this was like back in 2013 and this was a training called a fascial fitness training and it was taught by I'm not I feel like Travis you won't know who this is but Robert Schleip does that name ring a bell probably not Mm -mm. he's one of the most well-known fascia researchers he um he's based in Germany and uh yeah he's he also was a rolfer like Tom Myers Mm -hmm. um and 
he did a degree in human biology and he researches fascia and he applies um some of the uh, the knowledge he's taken from the fascia research into what he calls fascial fitness or like train fascial training and so he offers Clever. these certifications i know and i took it back in 2013 I went, it was like a weekend thing and i got certified in it fascial fitness no way you're a certified yeah. fascial fitness instructor uh yeah I was saying that's it in really a hesitant cool. way because that was like 10 years ago. <laughs> I don't, sure. I doubt it still. <laughs> You're not <Yeah>. sure anymore. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, it was, I took that and I learned about, you know, his version of what you should do to move your body in order to train your fascia. Um, and we will talk, we'll talk about that. Like, you know, I'm planning to talk about whether, whether and how you might actually train fascia specifically, like in this episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um Maybe maybe before we get to that, we kind of want to just establish a little bit more about like what fascia yeah. is. We said right. like in a summarized way, but I think, I think many of us have this like working idea of what fascia is, but just a more of a broader, more expansive definition. Um, so, you know, Travis, you know how I have a relatively new Facebook group that's called... I've heard. <laughs> I know. I feel like I keep mentioning it on the podcast because no, these days... I think you only mentioned it once. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's cool to have this group because when I know we're going to record a podcast episode on something, I've been liking to throw out to the group, like, you know, what have you heard about this? What questions oh, do you have? What did they Leading say? up to our... And so I asked them, I was like, we're going to record uh, an episode on fascia. And so just wondering, like, what, if, what, if, what claims do you hear about fascia out there? Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, this group just, I don't think I said, it's called Yoga and Movement Science, and it's anybody can join. It's uh, free, but it is private. So you join and request, and then you're accepted. But it's great stuff we Exclu talk about. Very exclusive. <laughs> right. But it's what is fun. The, the, uh, the application process is like? Oh, there's just, not even an application. You just hit re you just request, request to join. That's it. Okay. Yeah. There's, yeah. Um, at least at this point. But uh, anyway, so we talk about great geeky stuff and yoga, yoga geeky stuff in there. So I, I wanted to read a few definitions, a few things people said, because I thought they'll be interest, interesting for this conversation. And I'm sure our listeners maybe can relate to some of these. This will be, this is going to be three things that I'll say. And maybe you, you could tell me if you think maybe that. Oh no. Quote true or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here, here are three things that people said in the Facebook group about what they'd heard about fascia. Uh, my understanding is that the more we move and exercise, the more it gets tight and like a dry sponge gets harder and can restrict easy movement. Ooh. Here's a second one. My concept of fascia is that it's like a mesh bag over our muscles. It grows over time, even overnight. And without movement such as stretching, it can become stiff and cause us to feel we have less mobility. Techniques such as massage and foam rolling can help to break up stiffened fascia and help us feel more mobile. I bet I know what influenced that one. A hundred, yeah, we're, and we're going to probably <laughs> talk about that. Um, but don't you think it's funny, Travis, that both of these, these first two, the first one said mm -hmm. their understanding was that as, as we move and exercise, fascia gets tight. But then the second one said, uh, if we don't move, it gets tight. Whoa. Right? Like kind of we're two. We're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, I think that's interesting. So here's the third one I wanted to read you. Um, this one is that fa to, they've heard the fascia is like little microscopic hair like tissue that goes below the skin and over bones, muscles, organs, etc. This tissue lubricates with movement. When you stop moving, this little hair starts to get starts to grow all together like a Velcro getting hard and stiff and bringing that stiffness sensation to the body. That one had maybe the most truth to it until the second half of it. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> so when you said in that second one that I read that you were pretty sure what that was inspired by, um, mm -hmm. that's, uh, uh, what were you talking about? Like, what do you think, what I, I in that definition and what are you talking about? Recently exposed to a YouTube video called The Fuzz Speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, exposed by you, so uh, <laughs> I said with you, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was a speech, uh, ten years old, eleven years old now. Uh, two thousand nine, I believe. Two thousand nine, okay, so yeah. Older than that. 
um, mm-hmm. by a fella named Gil Hadley. That's Gil the Hadley. one. <laughs> um, and he's an anatomy teacher, sort mm-hmm. of. I mean, mm-hmm. he's a self-proclaimed anatomy teacher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not by any sort of scientific training, but he's not a researcher that I'm aware of. Right. Um, he but does he does lead. He leads a um, research light cadaver. He leads people in, in cadaver labs. So like through dissections, he like leads right. groups of people. Yeah. And so he has this video from 2009, you said, mm-hmm. uh, it's about five minutes long. Mm-hmm. I, again, I don't know if we should link that or not. <laughs> Maybe how many views one. do you remember how many views the video had too many millions i think i think one million at least on yeah. the link i sent you i don't know if there are and, multiple versions and, but oh yeah sure a lot of comments um mm-hmm. and, and basically he's 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 saying a lot of the same things that that person number mm-hmm. two mentioned mm-hmm. um probably the person number two had seen that video and was influenced by that. That's what I um, think. Yeah. About, about like, specifically um, the fascia growing overnight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, so Gil talks about that being the fuzz, right? Yeah. So, so he, doesn't he show like he has a cadaver? Oh yeah. Showing? Yeah. He's got some, some video of his cadaver dissections and, what he shows looks fuzzy, I guess. So that's mm-hmm, why, mm-hmm. why he he coined that term. Um, the fuzz, but right. yeah, he's he says when you sleep overnight, it gets fuzzy, and that is that feeling of stiffness we feel. Mm-hmm. So, I, and that when we stretch in the morning, that that melts the fuzz. Yeah, you and then he, that he, he moves that? his body kind of funny, and he goes, "Yes, I didn't used to move like this, but now I'm that's like right." This. <laughs> that's right um, to get because you're supposed to fuzz. melt the fuzz that accumulates melt, yeah. so quickly like overnight yeah yeah so and it seems that a lot of people buy into that um explanation i was not convinced um mm-hmm. I, I didn't find this argument very convincing mm-hmm. um i was further made skeptical when I went to his website and found that he was his academic training. So he is, a, he has a doctorate in mm-hmm. theology. That's right. Uh, he went to divinity like, school. Yeah. So that his PhD. Yeah. Another red flag for me. Um, but yeah, he seems to be uh, regarded highly in certain circles and mm-hmm. have this popularized this message that, has caught on in the the fascia world that's right like i would suggest that gil hadley is um yeah he's a pretty prominent figure in the quote fascia world and um i think that that video the fuzz speech uh was very influential like with a million views i think that's kind of permeated you know it's the type of video that people you know when they go to massage school they tend to be shown that video like i've been shown that video probably in mas- no maybe not in massage school because i think i did massage school before that video but when i took you're, the ball you're training, an og Right, exactly. I'm pre that. But definitely when I took the therapy ball training, we were shown that video. And oh, it's just wow. like a common one to be um, to be shown, especially like in the realm of body work and things like that. So I definitely wanted to share it with you. I just thought it was kind of um, important for you to be in the loop on that. Yeah, I'm surprised I hadn't seen it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm glad that I'm, I'm just kind now, of surprised too, actually. I'm, I'm enlightened. Now. You're now aware. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and a couple other things I wanted to point out about that video. What did I want to point out? So, um, I, according to Paul Ingram, who he's really great. We've had him on the podcast on our episode on, should we stop teaching uh, yoga for low back pain? Mm -hmm. And Paul is super research based. He's actually was, um, a body worker himself, a massage therapist. And now he writes about like pain, his website is painscience.com. He covers fascia and fascia, fascia research um, very copiously on his website. He's a great resource. Anyone who wants to really read more about all this, we definitely recommend him. But uh, on his website, he actually talks about this fuzz speech by Gil Headley. And he, according to him, so my source is just Paul Ingram in saying this, but according to Paul, the tissue that Gil showed in that YouTube video that he called the fuzz that he said accumulates overnight and that we need to melt with movement. 
according to Paul Ingram, that that um, that fuzz is actually something that only happens post mortem, <laughs> uh, like in a in a dead body, and it's like the beginning of, or it's part of rigor mortis when like tissues stiffen up because they're not alive anymore. And that probably Gil Helly didn't realize that like he, you know, he's been doing dissections. He probably saw this substance and was just you know, maybe made a guess as to what it was, what it, you know, how it grows, what um, its consequences are for us. But it doesn't seem that the claims he made in that video were really based on evidence, but more just maybe his own speculation. Um, even though the way that he was talking about it sounded a lot more sure, like this is what this yeah. is and this is why this happens. Uh, I, I think it was maybe just, yeah, just his guess or speculation based on seeing it. But according to Paul Ingram, that's um, tissue that doesn't really grow until, until your dead body. He, but, he took a good try. And right. it was a cute explanation. But as we yes. talked about in our episode of which experts to trust, right? Yes. Uh, anybody yes. who sounds too certain uh, yes. should be super bold. Be yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question. And another thing, too, about that video, and I, I think we're talking about it, too, because I'm pretty sure that uh, quite a few of our listeners will have seen it. It's pretty popular. Is because he's in a cadaver lab, he's wearing a white lab coat. So I, I also just think it's interesting, you know, a bit of like, uh, we see that as an authority, you know, that seems like someone mm. who maybe is a doctor or, you know, mm -hmm. has medical training. Um, and, and we just like further, may maybe that's also just part of what plays into like why um, so many people shared that video. Just one little thing about like, when you say who we should trust, like who we consider authority, what are the reasons people often just kind of quickly make assumptions based on who they should listen to. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing when I reviewed that video and I sent it to you the other day, I noticed that in that video, and this is just something that ties into greater themes beyond just this fascia topic. But I noticed that uh, Gil Hadley said that if you basically you can, um, he suggested or stated that you allow the fuzz to accumulate in your body um, by choice. Like he was like, you could be injured maybe, and then you're in, you the joint is immobilized and you can't move it, and then the fuzz will grow, and then that's not really your choice. But you can also just allow the fuzz to accumulate by choice because you're not moving your body, and so you need to. And these are like the words that were used in the video. Like you need to take responsibility for that fuzz and like mm -hmm. combat it or do something about it to like get rid of it, basically. And that type of language to me, it just kind of to my, I'm maybe a little prone to being sensitive around that, but. Um, I don't, it's, it sounds like the type of language we hear around, like your bad posture is causing you this pain. And like you're, um, you're posturing yourself incorrectly, or that's like lazy or, you know, or sitting in a chair is causing this, like these kind of blamey things. Like we do these things, um, mm. to ourselves, or your poor movement pattern, you know, like your mm -hmm. poor movement patterns is creating this injury for you. Just a little blamey. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like it's your yeah, fault basically. Yeah. Um, so that just kind of felt a little bit like that to me. And of course, I know these are bigger topics. And of course, to a certain degree, for sure, like if you never move your body, great things are not really bound to happen. Yeah. So I totally the, get that. The end advice isn't the worst, right? Like, right. oh, hey, we should be more active. Um, mm -hmm. But then the whole other four minutes and 45 seconds <laughs> of... Mm -hmm mechanistic mechanistic yes is just not helpful and actually probably has spawned this helped spawn an entire industry of perhaps over yeah. confident and overstated claims right right and tell me if you think um that you would agree with this but i i feel like a lot of the language coming out of the fascia or the quote fascia world is kind of this paradigm of the body and of pain that seems pretty rooted like in like a structural model of the body oh. you know like pain being rooted in structure totally. and in tissue right mm -hmm. yeah right okay so that's because we you know we talk in this podcast a bunch about how you know there's kind of a more updated paradigm for how we see um the body and pain and movement and like the biopsychosocial framework of pain and um pain's just more complex than what's happening in our tissues it doesn't just all boil down it's to just that. A, it's just another so as 
the fascist. <laughs> <laughs> that's how, that's what I think. I mean, there's yeah. a lot, fascist is really interesting. We want to learn about it. That's why we're talking about it here. But I agree with you that I think a lot of, a lot of the way fascia is treated is similar to the way the psoas muscle is treated. It's a biomechanical scapegoat. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It'd be nice if all of our pain were caused by it. And then there were specific manual techniques that could address it and mm -hmm. cure us of all that ails us. That's right. Not so simple. But it's not so simple because pain isn't really simple like that. <sighs> yeah. And um, we talked about this in, kind of, in some recent podcast episode about, I, we were talking about the psoas. And I mm -hmm. mentioned that I have this post I put on social media that's it's just a quote graphic and it says the psoas just as special as all 600 other muscles of the body. That's like this quote graphic that I put out just to say like, so is it special, but so are all the other, like they're all equally special. I have another quote graphic that's the same, except it's fascia. And it says oh, fascia, you do. Mm -hmm, just as special as all the other tissues of the body. Oh, I don't remember that one. It's I been like a while that. since I posted it, Travis. It's been a while, but I should put it up again. Um, but just, I it's funny it, you I would think draw it's that ready. Parallel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause you had, you had the same thought, I guess, as I did. Right. Right. That, that I think that's the thing. So this fascia story that you may have heard that many of us hear is that, that fascia is this like long overlooked tissue in the body. Mm -hmm. that it was like this tissue that previously was kind of seen and treated as quote, like the packing material in the body. And that when human, when um, cadavers were being studied, they'd be dissected and the fascia would just be like thrown on the floor as like not important. So that's kind of the story. Like it was just really overlooked. Um, and now we're realizing like now researchers are realizing that actually it matters a lot more. And it's more of this like alive um, mechanosensitive tissue that had really been overlooked before. So that's all totally true. Like we're definitely learning a lot more about it and it, it, it's not more, it's not simply packing material in the body, but mm -hmm. at the same time, that doesn't necessarily need to elevate fascia to make it more important than all the other systems of the body. Right. Mm -hmm. This is what I think anyway. And the right, trend yeah. I see is it just, yeah, it kind of gets elevated rather than seen as just, just on equal footing with all the other body systems it's like right so it's more like important. the pendulum swung mm -hmm. swung from we're not gonna care about this at all to now this is everything and hopefully it's shifting back towards more this is not this is this is not everything it's not nothing it just has its place 100 yeah I think that's a great way to put it. And as a tissue in the body, it's super important. Like we definitely want to know about it. We want to know as much as we can know about it. It's great that research is being conducted and the research is really pretty much in its infancy these days. So um, because not that much is really known about it, when you hear big, bold claims about what fascia is and like the pain and the trouble that it's causing in your body, it's maybe good to just maybe pause and question like, well, how do we really know that if science doesn't actually know that much about the tissue? How where are we getting these big claims from? Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to read you, Travis, three more things that people said in the Facebook group about fascia. So these are a little mm -hmm. bit a little bit different. And I think we'll kind of lead into some things these we're going to talk about. These are going to be the about. truths or these are going to be the lies. <laughs> you can tell me what you think. We'll see. Here's, here's the first one. Uh, I've heard of fascia for quite a while now. I always hear it brought up in a yin class, yin yoga, mm -hmm. and whenever the use of a massage ball or foam roller is used. So that's just kind of reiterating, I feel like, the because uh, um, that's what we're talking about. Like part two of this is we're going to talk about yin yoga and we're going to talk about myofascial release. But those mm -hmm. are two practices in which fascia seems to be really focused on. Mm -hmm. And this person's kind of attesting to that. So here's another one. Fascia is like a webbing that covers everything in our body and holds it in place. It's actually really strong and can't be released or broken down by massage or rolling. Ooh. Yeah, right? That's we're We are going to talk about that. But that's maybe a prediction of some truth around here. <laughs> And here's the third one. Um, I really like this. My sense is that it's a word that can have a lot attached to it. It needs to be quote released like other yoga parts need to be quote opened. Mm -hmm. 
I re- as I read that, I'm like, yoga. I just realized yoga parts. Um, maybe that was supposed to be something else. Um, but anyway, but I think the idea is just like fashion needs to be released. And in a yoga practice, we often talk like this needs to be opened. This muscle, like this stretch is opening your hamstrings. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that type of language, Travis, but that's kind of common in yeah. the yoga world. Openings, yeah, you know? I, I get it. I, yeah. Also, maybe synonymous with stretching. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or relaxing. Totally. Ex- yes. Right. So it's kind of these terms that kind of get associated in there. Um, but this person, had, my sense is that it's a word that can have a lot attached to it. I kind of agree. Like it's a it's, buzz term, yeah. like people. Yeah. Yeah. So I already talked about how fascia was this overlooked tissue, right? And it was kind of just disregarded as like the inert packing material of the body and therefore not important. Mm-hmm. And now we're learning that that is not true. And um, fascia is a lot more like mechanosensitive. It's more quote alive. It adapts inside of us and it changes. So that's all really cool. It's not just this kind of like inert packing material. And here's a here's a definition of fascia, kind of a summarized definition of fascia that I think works well. Fascia is a type of connective tissue that forms a continuous 3D body-wide web inside of us, surrounding and interpenetrating all of our muscles, bones, organs, nerves, and blood and lymph vessels. So that's kind of a a working definition that I like for fascia. Mm -hmm. Um, I think as we've kind of already implied in this conversation, it's good to realize fascia is literally everywhere inside of us. And on like micro and macro level, it's like everywhere. It's interwoven through everything. And that's very cool about fascia and fascia gets discussed in that sense a lot. Like it's the continuity of all of our tissues. But on the other hand, I I just think it's interesting to point out that we also have other systems in our body that are also everywhere in the body in like a very similar sense, like our nerves are everywhere in the body. Our muscles are everywhere. Like the muscular, the muscular system is everywhere. Uh, blood mm-hmm. vessels are everywhere. So it's like, yes, fascia is everywhere, but everything else is also everywhere, or at least not some those things that I mentioned. That. Yeah. That's it. That's it. It's not exclusive to that. So just an appreciation of um, the other systems, like everything is really like interconnected and kind of everywhere. Ooh. So I think like that's good, interesting to keep in perspective. Mm-hmm. Before we talk too much more about fascia specifically, I think it's helpful to just lay out the fact that uh, if we take a little step back, there are four tissue types in the human body. Did you know that, Travis? You probably have learned that before. Mm, like four basic tissue me, types. You're going to know them. <laughs> uh, four basic tissue types. The first is muscular tissue. Mm-hmm. And that's like our active tissue that, that contracts. Yeah. Do you know how do you know what a muscle is? <laughs> Heard of that one, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we have epithelial tissue. Have Heard you heard of that, that one? one too? And that's like tissue that like lines uh, the inner and outer surfaces of the body. Basically, we're just being very um, summer summarizing here. Like our skin is epithelium. Um, the linings of the digestive tract, things like that. That's um, epithelial tissue. Then we have nervous tissue which is just literally like the tissue that makes up the nervous system. So that's mm-hmm. neurons, which are nerve cells and then neuroglial cells, which like are supportive cells to the neurons. So that's like a third type of tissue, it's nervous tissue. And then we have a fourth tissue of the body and that's our main tissue of focus in this whole conversation. And that is connective tissue. That is connective tissue. And that's not necessarily fascia, Fascia mm-hmm. is a type of connective tissue, but all connective tissue is not necessarily fascia. So I think um, many of us have like an idea of what connective tissue is. Like we probably know like a tendon and a ligament, that's connective tissue. Like those are, we're pretty familiar with, like maybe our minds go there. Mm-hmm. Um, connective tissue is basically a tissue in the body that what really qualifies it as connective tissue is that it consists of what's called an extracellular matrix and cells. Those are just kind of like the ingredients that you need for a connective tissue. And in most of the connective tissues that we'd be interested in talking about today and with regard to fascia, uh, the extracellular matrix, it'll, it includes uh, something called ground substance, which is like this gel-like substance, and protein fibers. 
And so in the connective tissue types we're mostly talking about today, those protein fibers are collagen and elastic fibers, and they're predominantly collagen, uh, mostly collagen, but a mix of collagen and elastic fibers. So that's kind of what makes, well, like defines or what the quality is that you need to have as a connective tissue. And then in the human body, connective tissue, like the purpose of it, like its function, I mean, it's got many of them, but connective tissue, it just like supports the body. It provides structure to the body. It uh, protects, protects our insides. It protects the body, uh, connects, interconnects everything. Um, it helps move nutrients and other substances between tissues and organs. And then another important thing that connective tissue does, especially with regard to movement, which is kind of like our focus or our specific focus is um, that connective tissue transmits force from created by muscles. So like muscles contract and then connective tissue is what like transmits the force that muscles create. Mm -hmm. Does that all kind of make sense so far? Checks out. Okay, good, good. <laughs> so uh, if you wanna talk a little bit more about connective tissue, um, the, there are, are a few different categories of connective tissue and honestly, different sources really lay these out a little differently. So it, I feel like it's kind of mixed out there, but I'll just lay out, uh, here are three kinds that I feel like maybe are pretty common and make a lot, make a lot of sense. So one kind of connective tissue is supportive connective tissue, and that's basically bones and cartilage. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of think of that as like your hard, like hard in a very just casual sense, like bones are hard, cartilage, not hard, but not stretchy, like these other types of connective tissue. Mm -hmm. So bone and cartilage are supportive. They like support, you know, it makes sense. Bones like, you know, like supportive struts inside of us. Mm -hmm. And then the category of connective tissue that we're probably more familiar with thinking about is called proper connective tissue. And that's the stuff that's like stretchy and softer. And uh, when we think of tendons and ligaments, you can kind of see how that's like stretchy and softer, right? Than like a bone. Yeah, a little. Right, 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 right. Not too um, stretchy. Not too stretchy. But whereas bones and cartilage are compressive tissues, meaning that like they, you know, they adapt and grow stronger in response to compression, like bones, mm -hmm. you know, they like impact or the compression from a muscle contraction, like pulling on the bone, like that's compression. Yeah. Uh, comp uh, bones and cartilage light compression, but proper connective tissue, they're more, they, they like tension, they like pulling forces. Mm -hmm. They're like tensile tissues versus the others, which are compressive tissues. Yep. So maybe they don't stretch very far. You're right, like well, how far does a ligament really stretch? <laughs> yeah, but they stretch more than bone. Exactly. And they're designed to, st like they, they take pulling force better, but bones take pushing right. force better. Um, so tendons and ligaments are probably the ones that we think about first when we think like first come to mind, when we think of proper connective tissue, but they're also, um, joint capsules. There's also, uh, aponeuroses, which are like a broad, mm -hmm. like a broad tendon, like sheath, but it's got a lot of same properties as a tendon. And then we have, um, the connective tissue that's actually woven throughout muscles and surrounds muscles on the outside. And we've talked about that on the podcast before. Greg Knuckles, um, he laid those out for us in two episodes ago on just stretching, make you strong. But uh, we basically have like three layers of connective tissue in, in the muscles, in and around the muscles. We have the endomesium, which wraps around individual muscle fibers, the paramesium, which wraps around fascicles, which are bundles of muscle fibers. And then the epimesium wraps around the entire muscle. So it's like these three layers. Mm -hmm. They run all through the muscles at those unique like levels, and then they continue beyond when the muscle ends, those same layers continue on and they become the tendon, which is kind of what Greg was talking to us about. Remember, he was talking about the continuity of all of our tissues. Mm -hmm. We think about like muscle and tendon, we might think about them as like very separate, but they're actually like kind of, they're not, they're not separate. They're like really interwoven. Mm -hmm. So those are the um, proper soft, proper connective tissues we are most likely to think of. But we should also know that proper connective tissue includes a lot more than just that stuff. So also um, sheaths of connective tissue around nerves and blood vessels. So like tiny, like really tiny little sheaths. That's, that's proper, that's connective tissue. The connective tissue layer around bone is called periosteum, and that's also connective tissue. Um, there's something called deep fascia, which is like connective tissue that 
that runs like muscle to muscle, kind of contains the muscular system. We have visceral fascia, which that's like connective tissue that's surrounding our organs. Superficial fascia is fascia that's just underneath the skin. Um, it's also called subcutaneous tissue and superficial fascia contains adipose tissue, which is fat. So those were the first two subcategories of connective tissue. And the final one, there were three. The final one is uh, fluid or liquid connective tissue, which is maybe counterintuitive. I don't think we tend to think about that when we think of connective tissue, but technically blood and lymph are also connective tissues, but they're like liquid forms. And um, yeah, so they're also technically connective tissue. So that's kind of a lot, right? That is a lot. <laughs> And maybe just gives us a sense of like what we're talking about when we're at least talking about connective tissue, like we said, not necessarily fascia. So maybe we should bring this back to like, well, how does fascia tie into all of that? So okay. fascia is a type of connective tissue. And by my uh, looking into it, the definition of fascia is constantly evolving. And there have been a lot of like disagreements, like we're gonna call this fascia. No, we're gonna call this, like it's like really evolved over time and probably will continue to evolve. But I'm gonna read this, this section, uh, an excerpt from an article called Defining the Fascial System. And this is from 2016. And I, there may have been some amendments since then, but um, this, is, this is a paper by Adstrom et al, 2016. And Robert Schleip, who I mentioned, who does uh, fascial fitness, he's on this paper. And surprising, I thought this was surprising, Gil Headley is also an author on this paper. Um, so, he's a researcher after all. Right. He, got to, he gave input. And um, Carla Stecco, she's another well-known fascia researcher. So it's like a group of them. So this is what so they say. who's saying. who? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, the fascial system consists of the three-dimensional continuum of, of soft collagen-containing loose and dense fibrous connective tissues that permeate the body. It incorporates elements such as adipose tissue, so that's fat, right? Other mm -hmm. times you hear that fat is not fascia, but according to this, it is. Um, neurovascular sheaths, aponeuroses, deep and superficial fascia, epineurium, uh, that's like around nerves or neurons. Uh, joint capsules, ligaments, membranes, meninges, that's connective tissue in your spinal cord, myofascial expansions, periostea, plural of periosteum, uh, retinacula, septa, tendons, visceral fascia, and all the intramuscular and intermuscular connective tissues, including the endoperi and epimesium. Okay. Um, so that's a lot, right? I feel like they're... That's interesting mm -hmm. on a couple of accounts. Yeah, how? Um, because they're just like, the, a lot of those things you defined as something else. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Like a different type of tissue or connective tissue. And then they're saying, that's all fascia. Yeah. And yeah. I've heard, like, I've heard the endo, epi, and perimesium yes. are considered fascia. And I've actually always been a little confused as to whether <laughs> they were or whether they weren't. That's the muscular fascia that we, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, um, yeah. What yeah, it's confusing, Travis. <laughs> and I do <laughs> think, think, I think the terminology gets a little, um, different researchers might call things different things. So like the- The more important you think fascia is, the more things that are fascia. <laughs> I think that's precisely <laughs> it. If I had to say my impression is like the fascia community, Maybe they want to call, they just want to pull out of the broader connective tissue category, just all the like soft connective tissue that they see as completely interconnected or forming this like, you know, completely connected 3D network in the body. That's fascia. That's like what they want to delineate. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, it encompasses so much, like to my reading of it, it's a ton of what's already called connective tissue. Right. Um, just maybe not blood, not lymph, not bone, I don't see that they've called bone fascia and not cartilage. Right. I don't see those included on the list, but everything else tendons seems to be. and ligaments. Yeah, they, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, it's a, that's a choice, right? Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a categorization, but it seems like they've lumped in mm -hmm. a lot of distinct stuff. <laughs> in a way that I like I, I don't see how that could be helpful besides yeah. making it seem really important 
like, oh, yes. wow, look, all, all of these things are fascist. So this, this is the most. That's something that I've noticed that Paul Ingram writes. He like kind of suggests it's just like the more medically important you think fascia is as a tissue, the more <laughs> you just want to include like more and more in the category. Yeah. Uh, that seems, that's the tendency he seems to have identified here. Um, but I don't, to me, it's just like, you're basically saying that just about all connective tissue, except for a few, that's all just fascia, but it's like, we all, that was all, that was just connective tissue. Like it already had. A right. Name. <laughs> right. Oh right? man. It's a, it's a slick marketing technique, right? Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's, uh, take something that already has a name, call mm -hmm. it something else. And mm -hmm. then we're the experts in this thing. That's this right, new Jordan. thing that this no new one thing, knows about, except for thing. all of the previous research that's been done on connective tissue. Because that connective tissue, I think, has been known about for centuries. Like it's like been around for a long time. Maybe right. not appreciated to the same. You know, we're learning more about how it, like um, how it works in the body, but it's been known about as a structure for a long time. It's not like this brand new thing. Mm -hmm. Um. And speaking of brand new things, I think it's interesting that like sort of recently, one of the biggest like anatomical discoveries uh, in like the past few years is that researchers discovered that there's a um, specialized lymphatic system for the central nervous system. So like we have the lymphatic system all throughout the body, but there's like a special just kind of like a neuro lymphatic system just for the central nervous system. And it's it's supposedly this like really big discovery that's a really big deal in anatomy. But I feel like nobody talks about that. Like, why isn't that the big deal to talk about? You know, like, that's actually a huge anatomical Doesn't discovery. Have as funny of a name as fuzz, I guess. Yeah, right, 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 right. Um, so, okay, so something too that we've, that we've kind of laid out. So, so fascia has this very big umbrella definition that, like I said, is also changing and, you know, but um, that's a pretty, I think it's a pretty um, well used one or widely used one that I just read. Um, one question I have, Travis, and this is like, I just, I just asked this out there in general, but sometimes I ask this like on social media and I don't find that I get answers. Um, but when people talk about treating fascia or when they talk about training fascia or do, or targeting fascia, uh, what fascia are they talking about? Because fascia c contains so many different varieties. Like, are you talking, like, if you're saying, I don't know, it's body work and you're doing massage and it's a special fascia massage, or if it's yin yoga and you're stretching and you're targeting fascia, like, are you, are you talking about the periosteum around the bone? That's fascia. Or are you talking about fascia around um, blood vessels, the fascia in muscles, tendon, like there's just, you know, so much. The meninges yeah. is fascia. I always assumed that it was the fascia around the muscles, but that then leads to the question of well how can you target that and not target the muscles too yes Travis. Which think, and also I do think you is mean the, i think is the real crux of the matter how could you target it in isolation if it's so yeah. inter interwoven right. Right. yeah but i hear you like if someone's doing body work into a muscle like the belly of a muscle it kind of makes sense they're talking they must be talking about but even within the muscle there are blood vessels there are nerves yeah well that and that so that it's twofold one how can you target how can how can you target whatever fascia means how can you target just that yeah good at question. the exclusion of the other stuff yeah and then really the answer to that is that you can't and therefore you're targeting all of that yes travis <laughs> that's how i feel uh, right at, which is not bad it's in fact probably good um but it it's like we're trying to over specify mm -hmm. this thing that we we don't even have a uh, like you said nobody can answer that question well what what fascia do you mean um but yeah it just it speaks to this idea that you can't like like with the psoas right yeah. oh we're we're releasing the psoas well what about all the stuff that you have to get the psoas is really deep what about all the stuff right. that you have to get get through to get to the psoas you're probably not even getting to the psoas. You're probably just doing a lot of stuff superficially, mm -hmm. which is probably also true of the body work. That, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if, if fascia is all that stuff that you just mentioned, then sure. Um, you're, you're targeting it, but you're not, you're targeting all the other stuff too. 
Exactly. So it leads me to wonder something we've talked about on the podcast before, just like how, imp when is it important to be anatomically specific mm -hmm. in whatever we're doing, whatever we're talking about, be it yoga, body work, physical therapy, you know, sometimes it is important, I believe, but often being general is probably the more evidence-based way to go. Like, cause you just can't yeah. really be so specific. Which, which is why the myofascial umbrella is is maybe better than saying, oh, we're targeting fascia. Because you could say we're targeting the myofascia and the myofascia mm -hmm. system. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'm having a, maybe I'm walking it back and saying, oh, I think that's okay. But I really, I, I still think that's probably, no, that's definitely an over-specification. Because, I I, and I, maybe we're going to talk about this next time, but like, well, what are we, what are we actually changing? What yes, change I do, do think we we, we're going to, Yeah. It, it, if you're thinking like with body work, we're probably going to talk about that next time. Yeah. Um, but remember too, there's like skin and then there's uh, subcutaneous tissue too. They're like, and then there's um, deep fascia. Like there's just, there's just a lot in any like slice of the body, you know? Right. Um, but I totally agree with you that, yeah, myofascia as just a term, like we're talking about the muscle tissue and um, the fascia running through it collectively. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that's but, okay. Um... <laughs> but then, then layering on, well, if you're trying to target those things and then what changes are you making relative to what changes you're making in the nervous system? In the nervous system, Travis. And your that, that's... perception. <laughs> Well, if we think about that, the Gil Headley video that we mentioned earlier, he, uh, in that video, another thing he said was that the fuzz, you know, grows overnight. And um, if you don't like melt the fuzz, it'll make you feel stiff. Like it's going to cause the feelings of stiffness. And I just think it's interesting to bring that up because like, what do we know about what we actually feel in our body? Like where do feelings, where do perceptions come from? Like you just alluded to. Right. The nervous system listen to our episodes on interoception right but yeah right. so it's it's a perception so to say you're feeling stiff because this fuzz has developed overnight mm -hmm. it's such an oversimplification of well one there is no such thing as the fuzz <laughs> two um uh stiffness is a like a multifactorial phenomenon right. that may or may not be uh like your perception might, your your perception is legitimate. You feel mm -hmm. stiff. You feel stiff. You right. may or may not actually be stiff. Be stiff. Uh, like uh, from a measure, like if we were to measure how stiff your tissues were or you yeah. were through a range of motion. Um, That's right, Travis. So yeah, there's just there are a lot of uh, oversimplifications. Oversimplifications, and, yeah. That which is the nice way of saying errors in that <laughs> thought process yeah it's a, yeah it's a cute explanation though yeah it and it makes nice. some intuitive sense like yeah yeah it's simple and and again like we said earlier not wrong to say oh yeah and we should like, move yeah upon after sitting for a period after sleeping for a period we should move and stretch and that will help right us that's right that's right but just maybe like the mechanism or the explanation for why or what's happening May mm -hmm. or may not be totally yeah, because because if you don't move and you think that, well, if I don't move, this fuzz is just going to like overgrow uh, and and it's going to build and build and then I'm going to be stuck like that. Yeah. That's the danger of thinking that thinking that that could happen. Right. Yeah. Like, that's not a good thing to believe. And it's not true. So. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, you might yeah. feel stiff, <laughs> but it's not because you're fuzzed over. That's right. It's probably some complex output of your nervous system due to multiple factors. And yeah. Yeah. So it just seems like maybe um, in, in my impression, in a lot of the fascia talk, it's um, maybe overlooking the role of the nervous system. I feel like placing maybe too much emphasis on structure and tissue, which we know that can absolutely play roles in um some of the, some of these conditions uh but in but the nervous system is like so much more it's just more complex than than that yeah um but travis we got to talk about uh about connective tissue uh, fascia movement and the idea of training fascia mm -hmm. 
Like, well, is yeah, that something that, fitness. yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and I think this is a great topic, um, definitely relevant for like our yoga and movement audience. So this is not so much body work and this isn't yin yoga and stretching. We're talking now like active movement basically. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, can we, can we specifically target and train fascia as a tissue in the body, like through ways that we move? So I think in order to really get at that question, uh, it's important to go back to something we said earlier, which is that one of the purposes, one of the functions of connective tissue is to transmit force mm -hmm. from muscle contractions. So like we know that when muscles contract, the force that they create transmits through tendon and to the bone. And that's like what creates movement. So the tendon being connective tissue, or if fascia people would call tendon fascia, but it's also connective tissue. Um, but we also know that the tendon is not the only connective tissue in muscle that, or that transmits muscular force. So for a long time, it was thought that it, that tendon was the only tissue that did that. But mm -hmm. actually these days we know that, uh, research seems to suggest maybe it's around 50% of the force, uh, that muscles create is actually transmitted to the bone for movement via the intramuscular connective tissue via the epimesium, paramesium, endomesium. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like it radiates the force, uh, the force radiates uh, longitudinally down the muscle through the tendon, but it also radiates out laterally and is transmitted through the connective tissue that runs through the muscle. So um, that's just, that's, I think helps like broaden ideas around like how, like the relationship between muscle and connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And also how connective tissue isn't, you know, just this like inner packing tissue, but it actually um, helps us with movement. It's like very involved in movement. Muscles contract and connective tissues uh, like kind of receive that force and transmit it so that bones move and we move or, or we're just isometrically holding in place. But mm -hmm. um, so that's one way that like connective tissue and muscle kind of interrelate that way when it comes to movement. But then there is also uh, the topic of there's the fact that connective tissue also stores and releases elastic energy. And that happens when it's like pre stretched, basically. Mm -hmm. So you I know that you know about this, and you're maybe going to tell us more about this. And um, this is a, it's a little different than what I was just talking about with like a muscle contracts and that transmits force through the tendon to the bone. Now we're talking right. about something else. Can you, do you want to tell, tell us about this? Sure. What's this? So the, the biomechanical term for this is the stretch shortening cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's the, well, so the, the example that you gave before, let's just say, like, imagine that you go, um, in your stand, you're in mountain pose, Tadasana, mm -hmm. you go down into chair mm -hmm. and you sit for a while in chair and then you come out that would be a, a purely mm -hmm. um that would be what you just described in terms of how the forces are transmitted to create movement but you could imagine a situation where you rapidly drop from well you wouldn't do this in most yoga classes <laughs> um but, but we could if you, it. yeah, if you rapidly went from mountain pose into chair and immediately back out, you've now created this stretch shortening cycle where you've quickly mm -hmm. uh, gone from an eccentric contraction into a concentric contraction. Mm -hmm. um, so that process of going very quickly from eccentric to concentric puts this pre-stretch mm -hmm. on the muscle and tendon mm -hmm. and it stores elastic energy during the eccentric contraction and then releases it during the concentric contraction. And that stored energy actually produces more force than right. if you were to just uh, produce that all statically. So if you were, yeah. if you, well, actually, so we could go back to, if we, if we took the example of you hung out in chair pose and mm -hmm. then you jumped, you would jump a certain oh, height okay. and that mm -hmm. would be all 
of that first type of contraction that you talked about. But if you were instead of to if you instead of hanging out in chair pose, if you rapidly descended and then immediately came back up mm -hmm. into your into your jump, you've now have not only the benefit of the active contraction that you can create, but you also have the you can store and release that um, that energy through this stretch shortening cycle, and right. the end result would be that you jump even higher. So, right. uh, but the, the, so the, the crux of it is that you're rapidly transitioning from the concentric phase or sorry, the eccentric phase to the concentric phase. There is also a phase in between called the amortization phase, which is just the transition between, mm -hmm. um, eccentric and concentric and the faster you can, um, you can go through that phase or the shorter that amortization phase is, the more of the elastic energy that is stored will be returned. Right. Does that? Is yeah, that it does. Were, is that, was that the question? <laughs> Thank okay. you. And that's really yeah. cool. You put it in like yoga pose terms. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's easy to visualize hopefully the, you know, the. Yeah. Chair. And oh, and if you wanted to like more of the, the athletic, um, terminology for it uh we call the the that we would call that a counter movement jump yes. so the counter movement is the um portion of the exer the movement where you are going from standing into your squat or half squat or chair um that's the the counter movement and the the movement is the the jump out of it so you can do a counter movement jump where you go, you produce that rapid eccentric into rapid concentric, or you can do a non counter movement jump, which would be the first thing that we described, which was you, you could think about it as you just start in chair. You obviously, mm -hmm. you have to get to chair mm -hmm. um, from standing, but you, you would pause in that mm -hmm. chair pose before then jumping. That would be a non counter movement jump. That makes a lot of sense. So a squat jump is like you lower into a squat, you hold the squat for a bit, and then you jump up, and that's a squat jump. And then we know that a counter a squat, like a counter movement jump, which which involves rapid lower down and just spring right back up, you can mm -hmm. jump higher if you do it that way, right? Yeah, because of this phenomenon known as the stretch shortening cycle, which has like there's there's way more nuance to it, but there's yeah. there's both the mechanical properties of the this elastic storage and return and there's also a nervous system component mm, mm -hmm. to it as well that like just further accentuates the forces that you're able to create through right. the, the counter movement but it's like the idea is tell me if you think this is right but the stretch shortening cycle it both like enhances power like it for example could help you jump higher but another mm -hmm. thing it does is just improves it just helps us move more efficiently Right. Like if you're because like, you're taking I, advantage of this, stored yeah. energy you don't have to create that. It, you're, it's like, it's inside you, right? Right. It's like your muscles don't have to actively contract or not as much because you get this added help from like the passive tissues storing the energy and releasing it. Yes. So you don't have to like, you don't have to work so hard um, with muscle contractions and using ATP and all of that. You can, that can like back off a little bit and you can rely on just like the springiness of um tendons right mainly tendons. so that if you're to take it back to the fascia i guess the connection mm -hmm. here is that it the the stretch shortening cycle is taking advantage of this elastic storage and return through the passive structures which we're saying is the fascia that's right. That's right. And, and this is a very pretty specific fascia. Like it's from my right. understanding, stretch shortening cycle is mostly it's like tendon and, and aponeurosis, but not, you know, not like the fascia, fascial sheaths around your, your nerves. It's like specific connective mm -hmm. tissues really. Um, but like, yeah, that idea that just like uh, when you stretch and recoil the stored energy out of the connective tissue that helps you move um helps with movement economy and movement efficiency and like 
if you do my understanding, tell me if this is wrong, Travis, but my understanding is that the stretch shortening cycle, we tend to think about it in terms of jumping and plyometrics, but that mm -hmm. it's also involved just when you're walking or when you're running, like you still get like that. You still have that kind of bounciness from your connective tissues. Yeah. I mean, certainly still involved. running. Yeah. Right. Maybe, maybe to a lesser extent in walking. Yeah. I thought but, I'd read some sources that said it, you, it did, but I don't really know. You know better than I do. Per, perhaps. Um, but it seems, it seems like cycl cyclical type movement, like running tends to utilize the special. Yeah, for sure. And may, maybe more, maybe more in terms of the movement economy and movement efficiency side of things, when it comes to plyometrics and maybe like athletics, then the power enhancement maybe comes more into play. Like you're trying to jump higher and things like that. But if you're just like walking around, you're still using or running around, you're still using, um, using the connective tissues that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how I would see the fascia is kind of tying into this question, you know? And, um, when I took the fascial fitness training with Robert Schleip, and he also has a, a published paper on this that like anybody can look up where he talks about training fascial tissues. So he kind of lays out this recommendation, which is that um, it's, a, it's not like super specific, but the recommendations for if you want to train fascia, basically, he recommends that you do what I would call just kind of soft, bouncy movements, basically. So an example of one is you might be standing and you lift your arms up overhead and then you like sweep down your arms and your torso down into a standing forward fold and then you rise rapidly back up and then you go down and back up this is like something okay. that he would recommend do you see how that's kind of like bouncy down and up? yeah yeah um and another sounds like a ballistic stretch yeah i could that's my I well would... yeah ballistic stretching is more like bouncing at end range he's really talking mm -hmm. about sort of the full bouncing from the top to the bottom to the top yeah 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 maybe a little um, slower that's still I'm... not still like a more like a very flowing you're not spending time in the forward fold you're no like hitting that stretch and then coming out yeah that's like one type of movement another example of that type is basically what i think you and i would call um an elevated or an incline push-up with your hands at the wall. So he has someone like in a, basically, yeah, an incline push-up with the hands at the wall and they bounce off the wall. An incline plyo push-up. Yeah, but he, in in my impression of what he, how he describes it, it's not like as fast as possible, but it's just like bounce and then down and then bounce. It's more yeah, soft. Do, but do, like, would your arms, would your hands leave the wall? I believe that they do leave the wall. Okay. I believe. I shouldn't say that yeah. for sure. Cause I'm actually, the, there's a picture of it, but not a, it doesn't show both stages in this paper. So I'm not positive, but yeah, maybe, maybe you do keep the hands on the wall and you just do, you just, I'm not sure. If, but you anyway. actually, if your hands left the wall, then I, um, I'm buying <laughs> that, that, that's a, that would be <laughs> a plyometric. Right. Okay. But then, um, that's one recommendation. Another recommendation he suggests is slow and dynamic stretching. And there's like a stretch that they show in this paper and that I remember learning in the training I took, which is basically you down dog with your hands up on a chair and they call it like the big cat stretch. So your hands are on a chair and you're reaching your hips back and you kind of maybe shift your hips side to side. Um, I went on the fascial fitness website and I looked at this YouTube video they had, which was like a sample class of, you know, fascial fitness. It was taught um, taught by someone and it was like on a yoga mat with a chair. And to me, it just looked like yoga. As far as like Perfect. the mood, it was just the type of movements were just like Great. yoga. So we don't have to worry about this at all. So, well, that's the thing, Tra I mean, that's what I would suggest here is that I'm not sure that this proposed fascial fitness stuff is anything that really needs to be specifically brought out because I kind of think it's already in so many other move types yeah. of movement. But, but a couple of those examples of the, like the, the first two that you gave with the mm -hmm. rapid reach up, rise up, and then, you know, swan mm -hmm. dive. Mm -hmm. And then the wall plyometric push up. Those might not happen in a traditional yoga class that would move more slowly. Yeah, but I, I'm not suggesting it's all yoga. Okay. Like just okay. athletics, yeah. running, like there's just all these other oh. ways that people can move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we cover these things. <laughs> there's 
and, and we don't talk about them as fascial training. They're just exactly they're just exercise. We're That's... already yeah. We're <laughs> the point is that we're already working all of these things without even having to like make any sort of deliberate effort to do so. That's exactly, thank you for putting it that way. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That's my impression <laughs> of taking the training and then reviewing it recently and prep for this is like, yeah, it's, it's like attempting to pull out this tissue to target it in a special way, but it's like, we kind of already do kind of do all those types of movements anyway. And we don't, like you said, we don't have to think about it, but yeah. Travis, I have one more thing I want to, I'd like to layer on to this, to this about the idea of training the fascia, Okay. which is that, um, so we, we, we actually have a growing amount of research re that's relatively recent that's on tendons and how to adapt tendons to make them mm. to positively adapt tendons. And that's probably the tissue, the connective tissue type in the body where we really have the most to go on. If we mm. really want to look at what is actual research suggests, like what have um, randomized controlled trials suggested, like not just like this is me speculating and theorizing based on, but actually like what has research shown that can mm. adapt connective tissue. And it's um, the tendon is what we have the most information on. Mm -hmm. And so in just, just to summarize it, what it looks like you actually need to do in order to uh, adapt tendon is, uh, well, first of all, maybe we can just quickly lay out, like, what do we mean by adapt anyway? Like what, when we say we're targeting the fascia, we're training the fascia, like what's the outcome measure? That's often kind of like- It's a great question. <laughs> Thank you. I find that it's often kind of vague. Like I'll see just in general out there on social media, like we're making our fascia healthy, you know, just, or this is good for the fascia. That's that's a really fundamental question, right? Yeah. Like independent of what what are what are we doing and we're tar like what are we targeting and how but then how do you know? Exactly, Travis. With muscle you can measure uh, strength, you can measure hypertrophy or cross sectional mm -hmm. area. With bone, you can like measure bone density. Bone density, yeah. But how do you measure the strength of fascia, or the the the? Well, that's the, the question. Fascia. Like, what what are we looking for? Like, what is the outcome? Uh, what's the adaptation, right? So, um, in the tendon research, the tissue, like the qualities of tendon that research looks at to see whether the tendon adapts, is this kind of threefold. So there's just stiffness, stiffness, which I know, you know, you know what stiffness is. That's like um, how much force it takes to lengthen. And here it would be for like the entire tendon. So how much force you have to put into like lengthen the tendon to pull, pull mm -hmm. it. Um, and then we have something called modulus, which mm -hmm. is whereas just stiffness that I just mentioned, that's kind of dependent on like the length of the tendon and the, and the cross sectional area or the thickness. So like a, um, a thicker tendon will just naturally be stiffer, you know, or a shorter tendon will be stiffer. But with modulus, that's also a measurement of like stress, com stress compared to strain or like how much force you need to put in to pull it. But it's uh, not dependent on cross-sectional area or length. It's more just like per unit of cross-sectional area. Does that sort of make sense? I feel like this is confusing. Young's modulus? Yes, perhaps? yes. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So it's like a, it's like a measurement of just the, the material, how, how the materials of the tendon are made up and how, how well they resist, like the length change independent mm -hmm. of thickness and length, but still more modulus will make the tendon stiffer. So it's, it's related. Um, so there's stiffness, there's modulus, and then there's cross-sectional area, which is the thickness of the tendon. Those are like the main three things that research seems to look at for tendon adaptation. And generally it's like ultrasound that they use to measure these things. Mm -hmm. So on the whole, and I, I've looked at quite a bit of this research on tendon adaptation, like over the past, since like uh, the past couple of decades. And um, what it seems like is that, and of course this is still evolving everything, you know, nothing is like for sure, but it seems that research suggests that in order for tendons to adapt, which means they get stronger, which means that one, two, or three of those qualities I just listed, like they favorably adapt stiffness, modulus, or cross-sectional area. Mm -hmm. You need basically it's resistance training 
at moderate to high loads. That's basically what you need to do to make tendons mm -hmm. stiffer. What so, sometimes in a very casual sense, I, I just say stronger, you know, tendons stronger, but it's not strength the same way that muscles are stronger. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want your tendons to be stronger, then it, it's resistance training with moderate to heavy loads. And that, that means like 70% um, of your one RM or higher generally. Mm -hmm. And I, there's some research that shows maybe you need more, but some research shows you actually could use less. So it's a little like not, not so um, certain, but generally it's like the tendon, what it needs is it needs to strain. It needs to be able to lengthen. Mm -hmm. um, but in order for that to happen, the rate of loading, it's actually more optimal if the rate of loading is slow which you get with strength training, you don't get it so much with jumping and plyometrics and bouncy type movements. And actually research suggests that those movements don't actually adapt tendon as well as resistance training does. Interesting. A lot of the earlier and, tendon res sorry, what were you gonna say? I was just gonna say, I know that a lot of the time they make a fuss about whether it needs to be eccentric or isometric. Oh yeah. Or eccentric, concentric, isotonic. I'm glad and, you brought that up. It doesn't matter. No, I mean, yeah. that's what it seems that research today suggests is contraction type yeah. doesn't matter, but we used to think yeah. they used to think it did. Yeah. But now it doesn't because the tendon is just like, it doesn't know what type of contract. It just knows that it's being pulled on, you know? Um, and because tendons are stiffer, like mechanically stiffer than muscles, then, uh, then in order to get the tendon to lengthen, which that's what you need, you need it to strain for it to adapt. The muscle has to be contracting pretty hard in order to pull the tendon into length. And that's why it needs to be strength training and that's why it needs to be higher loads. Does that make sense? So that the mm -hmm. muscles work hard enough to actually pull the tendon because tendon is stiffer than muscle. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. So to be clear, apparently plyometric training, which I have to point out plyometric training isn't necessarily the same as like soft bouncy stuff that like is recommended in the fascial, fascial fitness um because it's you know it's like jumps and it's fast and you probably know the technical definition of what plyometric training is but i think the technical definition of plyometric training is that it uses the stretch shortening cycle oh i thought i had read it was like ground contact time had to be really you know a certain amount of yeah there might be something to that as well right but um the research that we have does suggest that plyometric training can make tendons a little stiffer but not as as much as uh, resistance training does. Resistance training, it has like that optimal combination of the qualities that you need. Again, that's the tendon needs to strain, the load needs to be moderate to high, and the loading rate needs to be low rather than high. Mm -hmm. So I find that really interesting because uh, when you're talking about using the stretch shortening cycle and the activities we've been talking about that do it, plyometrics, running, hopping, things like this, um, I think it's not really the case that those activities really make the tendon much stronger. Um, it's more that they just use the tendon that way. They mm -hmm. use the tendon as a spring. Those, those activities do, but it doesn't, it's not like enough load to actually make the tendon grow stronger. I mean, maybe a little bit, like I said, um, mm -hmm. maybe a bit, but not the same as resistance training. So if you really want to make tendon stronger and maybe by extension, since that's the connective tissue we have the most research on, maybe we can extrapolate that since it's the best we know right now we can extrapolate tendons to other connective tissue it would seem to me that resistance training strength training is really what the best thing to do to make them stronger um, and then it's strong and then you can use it because it's strong and it's probably less injury prone because you made it stronger when you use it in the stretch shortening cycle yeah i mean i would still I, like if you had to pick one i guess okay, strength training is the answer, but you never have to pick just one. So it's like, well, mm -hmm. if I want to cover all my bases, then I could do strength training and I could do plyometrics. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's what most seen... yogis are doing neither. <laughs> Travis, exactly. Most yogis are doing neither. So, and we have a whole strength training program for yogis that also includes some explosive type stuff strength our strength for yoga is mostly strength training but we have sprinkled in a little bit of the more explosive um more plyometric -y type things because yeah yoga, yogis don't get either in a yoga practice mm -hmm. um yeah so travis uh that was kind of what i what i'd wanted hoped for us to talk about with regard to like training fascia 
which I hope helps show that, yeah, it's not like, you know, talking about fascia. I mean, fascia and connective tissue plays a really important role in our movement and um, we can train it. Uh, but uh, it's just helpful to understand more like what the research really suggests. What does it need for that? Um, you know, what do we do? If we're just doing yoga, we may not be adapting um, our connective tissue to be stronger, to be stiffer, if that's all we're doing. But what about yin? <laughs> Ooh, can this be like a premonition that's, for... That was, yeah, that's where I was I love going. it. Is it like to be continued? Yeah. We're going to talk about yin and we'll talk about myofascial release in our second part two of this two-part series. So do you think we've um, we've kind of covered fascia so far pretty well? We've talked about what it is and how we might think about training it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, to be continued, everybody, listen to our next episode uh, that will come out next. Thanks for talking to me about this today, Travis. Thank you, Jenny. I learned a lot. Yay.